Hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is Ms. Skoken. We're back in chapter eight, this time finishing up our study of confidence intervals with estimating a population mean. Our objectives for this section are very similar to the section objectives for section two. State and check the conditions for inference, this time for a population mean confidence interval. Explain how the t-distribution is different from the standard normal distribution and why we use a t-distribution. Determine the critical values for a C percent confidence interval for a population mean using either a table or technology, our graphing calculators. Construct and interpret a confidence interval for a population mean and determine the sample size required to obtain a C confidence interval for population mean for a specific margin of error. This is similar to what we did in section two also when we calculated the minimum mean necessary to get the results that we want. In this entire chapter, chapter eight, where we're building the confidence intervals, our purpose, our objective, is to create a range of plausible values that serves as our estimate for a population parameter. In section two, we were interested in population proportion. In section three, we're interested in population mean. We want to estimate population mean. We're going to use a sample statistic, sample mean, in order to estimate our population mean. But we need a range of plausible values because we can't make an estimate that's exact. So our range of plausible values constitutes our point, our estimate, and that's our point estimate plus or minus that margin of error. Now, we know when the sampling distribution of X bar is close to normal, we can standardize, we can use the z-score, and the z-score allows us to find a standardized, and use that for the probability, a standardized value, and then we can calculate the probability on a less than or greater than basis. In this case, we want to find the probability. We want to use the sampling distribution of X bar, but our big issue is take a look at the formula for our standard deviation of the sample sampling distribution. We need to know the population standard deviation, but if we don't know the population mean, there's no way for us to calculate the difference from that unknown value, which is our standard deviation, uh, population standard deviation. So instead, we substitute in and we substitute in the sample standard deviation, our S sub X instead of our sigma. So this is now called the standard error because we're using the sample value. Because that's off a little bit, it's not as accurate, it's not as uh, close as our normal distribution, we're going to use a different probability distribution that is bell-shaped like the normal distribution, but is not exactly the normal distribution. It has the T distribution is what it's called, and sometimes it's called student T. And what this is going to look like is it, it's going to be bell-shaped, but it's going to have more tail area. It's still going to be symmetric, it's still going to be unimodal, but it's going to have, it's going to look like it's floating above the axis just a little bit, and it's going to be slightly shorter, lower frequencies in the middle because there's a greater frequency in the tails. We know the area under the entire curve is still equal to one, just like in our normal curve. So here's an example of T versus Z. This is a T distribution versus a Z distribution. And you can see how much more compact the higher frequency in the center and the less tail area in the Z or the normal distribution compared to the T distribution, which has a wider range, a larger standard deviation, and a lower frequency in those center values. So T, just like Z, is going to tell us how far away our sample statistic, our sample mean, is from the population mean. And we're going to count in standard deviation units, just like we did for the normal distribution. This time, though, which T distribution curve we're going to use is going to be based on the degrees of freedom, and degrees of freedom is based on the sample size. For this chapter, 
the degrees of freedom, as I said, is going to be based on the sample size, and it's going to be the sample size minus 1. So our degrees of freedom is going to help us to find the t star when we're creating our confidence interval. So here we see various curves. The tall one in the center, the purple solid, is the standard normal. And you can see that we have two curves shown, one with two degrees of freedom, which means that's the red dashed line. That would be a sample size of three. And one, the other one, the kind of dotted aqua color, is nine degrees of freedom. So that would have been a sample size of 10. So for every sample size, there's actually a unique T curve. We can see that the T distribution curves are very similar to the standard normal curve, that bell shape, unimodal, symmetric shape. The spread is a little bit more than the standard normal. You can see that we have that lower frequency in the center, a little bit more tail area, and it's a little bit wider. The T distribution has more probability in the tail, as I just said, and less in the center than the standard normal, but overall the shape is very similar. And as the degrees of freedom increases, or as the sample size increases, the T curve is going to approach the standard normal curve. Let's practice finding the appropriate T star for a few different situations. If we want a 95% confidence interval based on a simple random sample of size n equals 12, what we can do is go to table B. We're going to be looking in the degree of freedom, freedom row for 11, and we're going to be looking in the column for 95% confidence. And where those two meet, we get our T star, which is 2.201. When we want a 90% confidence interval from a random sample of 48 observations, our degrees of freedom is going to be 47. We're going to look for that row. And our column is going to be 90% confidence. Now, when we look for that 47 degree of freedom row, we're not going to find it. What we see is we see a 50 line and we see a 40 line. We cannot use 50 because it is going to be too narrow of a margin of error that will result. So what we need to do is use the more conservative value of 40 degrees of freedom. And that means we intersect with our confidence level, we're going to end up with 1.684. Now this is not the only way to do it. If we want to get a closer, a more accurate confidence uh, interval by getting a more accurate degrees of freedom, then what we can do is we can use our calculator and we can use inverse t to find the t star that goes with a specific degrees of freedom. Let's talk about conditions. We want to estimate the population mean. So we're still going to be checking conditions for our state plan do conclude format. Random, remember, is always the most important condition and we need to come from a well-designed random sample or randomized experiment. Our 10% rule, that's having to do with the relationship between the sample size and the population size, that is strictly about independence, and that's because we typically sample without replacement. Just a reminder, when we sample from an infinite population, the 10% rule is automatically met. But again, this sometimes we can call it the 10% rule, we can also call it our independence rule. And then last of all, we have our normal or large sample or large count condition. And here, because we're talking about means, we need to meet the central limit theorem, or so a sample size 30 or greater, or we need to have the sampling done from a population that is normal, or if neither one of those two conditions are met, then we're going to need to graph the sample data to check and see if our sample is approximately normal. If we have strong skew or we have outliers present, we cannot use normal procedures, period. Let's talk about constructing the confidence interval. We're going to always have that same format where it's a point estimate plus or minus our margin of error. Because we don't know our sigma, we're going to 
create our confidence interval using the standard error, which is a standard deviation of the sample instead. And we're going to use our appropriate T star value for our critical value. So that means that our confidence interval is going to be sample statistic, which is our X bar, plus or minus the critical value, which is our T star, times the standard deviation of the statistic, which is our standard error. Conceptually, this is very similar to what we did in section two for proportions. The mechanics are just slightly different because we're using the T distribution instead of the Z distribution. In both cases, we're still using a one sample interval. Here's an example about auto pollution that's from your textbook. And we basically have a sample mean and a sample standard deviation for the nitrous nitrogen oxide levels in light duty engines and the sample size is 40. So we want to construct and interpret a 95% confidence interval. This means we're using state plan do conclude. We start out with state, work on plan, and that includes all the conditions. Once we're done with that, we do our calculations. Pause the video if you need to so you can write this down, but this is the format that we're gonna answer every single time we need to create a confidence interval. Our do is the calculation of the confidence interval. And again, remember that we can either use a more conservative value if our degrees of freedom is not on the table, or we can use the calculator. Once we construct the confidence interval, we can show it as the point estimate plus or minus the margin of error, but our final answer is always going to be an interval format with the lower boundary and upper boundary because that's what we're going to be using in our conclusion. Again, if you need to pause the video to write this down, that's great. Otherwise, it is in your textbook so that you can review that example in detail. There's another very important question that is in this section, just like it was in our proportion section, and that is choosing the minimum sample size that will yield a margin of error that we want and a confidence level that we're, that is our objective confidence level. So we start out with our margin of error formula and we rearrange until we're able to solve for N, our sample size. There is another example in your textbook about monkeys and experiments on the, no the number of monkeys that need to be used for testing, and they're testing the cholesterol of the monkeys. So pause the video to read the question, and then turn the video back on when you're ready to discuss how this problem is solved. In this case, we don't have a sample. So we can't use the sample standard deviation. Instead, they give us a historical standard deviation of five. That's on a previous study. So that's the one that's going to be used. Now, if you notice, we end up with a sample size that needs to be greater than or equal to 96.04 when we plug everything in. This means that we need at least 97 monkeys because that fraction of a monkey means we need to go to the next monkey, whole number monkey, to be able to have the minimum sample size to get the confidence level that we need and the margin of error that we are looking for. This was brief. There's a lot of detail in this section. Be sure to do your practice problems so you can really get a good sense of how to work these through. Remember to pay close attention to the definitions and the connections between different items such as your confidence level and your T star when we use T instead of Z, what the effect changing the sample size has on our margin of error, and so on. Those are all different types of questions that can end up being multiple choice style questions. So good luck in this section. I'll see you in class.